Lesson 10 Husbands and Wives Together at the Cross Sabbath Afternoon August 26 God made from the man a woman to be a companion and helpmeet for him, to be one with him, to cheer, encourage, and bless him, he in his turn to be her strong helper. All who enter into matrimonial relations with a holy purpose, the husband to obtain the pure affections of a woman's heart, the wife to soften and improve her husband's character and give it completeness, fulfill God's purpose for them. Christ came not to destroy this institution, but to restore it to its original sanctity and elevation. He came to restore the moral image of God in man, and he began his work by sanctioning the marriage relation. The Adventist Home, page 99 He who gave Eve to Adam as a helpmeet performed his first miracle at a marriage festival. In the festal hall, where friends and kindred rejoiced together, Christ began his public ministry. Thus he sanctioned marriage, recognizing it as an institution that he himself had established. He ordained that men and women should be united in holy wedlock to rear families whose members, crowned with honor, should be recognized as members of the family above. Christ honored the marriage relation by making it also a symbol of the union between him and his redeemed ones. He himself is the bridegroom. The bride is the church, of which, as his chosen one, he says, Thou art all fair, my love, there is no spot in thee. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 7. The family tie is the closest, the most tender and sacred of any on earth. It was designed to be a blessing to mankind and it is a blessing wherever the marriage covenant is entered into intelligently in the fear of God and with due consideration for its responsibilities. The Ministry of Healing, page 356. Marriage, a union for life, is a symbol of the union between Christ and His Church. The spirit that Christ manifests toward His Church is the spirit that the husband and wife are to manifest toward each other. If they love God supremely, they will love each other in the Lord, ever treating each other courteously, drawing in even cords. In their mutual self-denial and self-sacrifice, they will be a blessing to each other. Men and women may reach a high standard if they will but acknowledge Christ as their personal Savior. Watch and pray, making a surrender of all to God. The knowledge that you are striving for eternal life will strengthen and comfort you both. In thought, in word, in action, you are to be lights in the world. Take Christ as your pattern. Hold him up as the one who can give you power to overcome. Utterly destroy the root of selfishness. Magnify God, for you are his children. The Adventist Home, pages 95 and 96. Sunday, August 27, Counsel to Christian Wives How much trouble and what a tide of woe and unhappiness would be saved if men and women also would continue to cultivate the regard, attention, and kind words of appreciation and little courtesies of life which kept love alive and which they felt were necessary in gaining the companions of their choice. If the husband and wife would only continue to cultivate these attentions which nourish love, they would be happy in each other's society and would have a sanctifying influence upon their families. They would have in themselves a little world of happiness. This Day with God, page 335. The Lord has constituted the husband the head of the wife to be her protector. He is the houseband of the family, binding the members together, even as Christ is the head of the church and the savior of the mystical body. Let every husband who claims to love God carefully study the requirements of God in his position. Christ's authority is exercised in wisdom, in all kindness and gentleness. So let the husband exercise his power and imitate the great head of the church. Neither the husband nor the wife should attempt to exercise over the other an arbitrary control. 
Do not try to compel each other to yield to your wishes. You cannot do this and retain each other's love. Be kind, patient, and forbearing, considerate, and courteous. By the grace of God, you can succeed in making each other happy, as in your marriage vow you promised to do. The Faith I Live By, page 259. The Hebrews were not willing to submit to the directions and restrictions of the Lord. They simply wanted their own way to follow the leadings of their own mind and be controlled by their own judgment. Could they have been left free to do this? No complaints would have been made of Moses, but they were restless under restraint. God would have his people disciplined and brought into harmony of action, that they may see eye to eye and be of the same mind and of the same judgment. In order to bring about this state of things, there is much to be done. The carnal heart must be subdued and transformed. The Lord would not have us yield up our individuality. But what man is a proper judge of how far this matter of individual independence should be carried? The Apostle Paul exhorts his brethren, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. In writing to the Ephesians, he says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 360. Monday, August 28. The Church as the Bride of Christ, Part 1. We are living in the closing scenes of these perilous times. The Lord foresaw the unbelief that now prevails, respecting His coming. And again and again, He has given warning in His word that this event will be unexpected. The great day will come as a snare on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Luke chapter 21 verse 35. But there are two classes. Some will be ready when the bridegroom comes and will go in with him to the marriage. How precious is this thought to those who are waiting and watching for his appearing. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 27. Those whom God loves enjoy this favor because they are lovely in character. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 129. In his intercessory prayer for his disciples, Christ declared, The glory, character, which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. John chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. Today it is still his purpose to sanctify and cleanse his church, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 26 and 27. No greater gift then the character that he revealed can Christ ask his Father to bestow upon those who believe on him. What largeness there is in his request! What fullness of grace every follower of Christ has the privilege of receiving! Oh, that we might more fully appreciate the honor Christ confers upon us! By wearing his yoke and learning of him, we become like him in aspiration, in meekness, and lowliness in fragrance of character. God's Amazing Grace, page 322. Very close and sacred is the relation between Christ and His Church, He the Bridegroom, and the Church the Bride, He the Head, and the Church the Body. Connection with Christ, then, involves connection with His Church. The Church is organized for service, and in a life of service to Christ, connection with the church is one of the first steps. Loyalty to Christ demands the faithful performance of church duties. This is an important part of one's training, and in a church imbued with the master's life, 
it will lead directly to effort for the world without. Education, page 268. Tuesday, August 29, The Church as the Bride of Christ, Part 2 In both the Old and the New Testament, the marriage relation is employed to represent the tender and sacred union that exists between Christ and His people. To the mind of Jesus, the gladness of the wedding festivities pointed forward to the rejoicing of that day when he shall bring home his bride to the Father's house, and the redeemed with the Redeemer shall sit down to the marriage supper of the Lamb. When the vision of heavenly things was granted to John the Apostle, he wrote, I heard the voice of mighty thunderings saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 19, verses 6, 7, and 9. The Desire of Ages, page 151. Paul pleaded with those who had once known in their lives the power of God to return to their first love of gospel truth. With unanswerable arguments, he set before them their privilege of becoming free men and women in Christ, through whose atoning grace all who make full surrender are clothed with the robe of his righteousness. He took the position that every soul who would be saved must have a genuine personal experience in the things of God. The apostles' earnest words of entreaty were not fruitless. The Holy Spirit wrought with mighty power, and many whose feet had wandered into strange paths returned to their former faith in the gospel. The name of God was glorified, and many were added to the number of believers throughout that region. The Acts of the Apostles, page 388. To his faithful followers, Christ has been a daily companion, a familiar friend. They have lived in close, constant communion with God. Upon them the glory of the Lord has risen. In them the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ has been reflected. Now they rejoice in the undimmed rays of the brightness and glory of the King in His majesty. They are prepared for the communion of heaven, for they have heaven in their hearts. With uplifted heads, with the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness shining upon them, with rejoicing that their redemption draweth nigh, they go forth to meet the Bridegroom. A little longer and we shall see the King in His beauty, a little longer and He will wipe all tears from our eyes. Then by innumerable voices will be sung the song, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He shall dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. God's Amazing Grace, page 358. Wednesday, August 30. Love your wife as you do yourself. God himself gave Adam a companion. He provided an helpmeet for him a helper corresponding to him, one who was fitted to be his companion and who would be one with him in love and sympathy. Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal, to be loved and protected by him. A part of man, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, she was his second self, showing the close union and the affectionate attachment that should exist in this relation. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29. God celebrated the first marriage. Thus the institution has for its originator the creator of the universe. Marriage is honorable, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. It was one of the first gifts of God to man, and it is one of the two institutions that, after the fall, Adam brought with him beyond the gates of paradise. When the divine principles are recognized and obeyed in this relation, marriage is a blessing. It guards the purity and happiness of the race, 
It provides for man's social needs. It elevates the physical, the intellectual, and the moral nature. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 46. The husband violates the marriage vow and the duties enjoined upon him in the word of God when he disregards the health and happiness of the wife by increasing her burdens and cares by numerous offspring. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the Church. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25, 28, and 29. We see this holy injunction almost wholly disregarded, even by professed Christians. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 425. From every Christian home, a holy light should shine forth. Love should be revealed in every act. It should flow out in all home intercourse, showing itself in thoughtful kindness and gentle, unselfish courtesy. There are homes where this principle is carried out, homes where God is worshipped and truest love reigns. From these homes, morning and evening prayer ascends to God as sweet incense, and His mercies and blessings descend upon the suppliants like morning dew. My Life Today, page 33. Thursday, August 31. The One Flesh Model of Marriage. If the hearts were kept tender in our families, if there were a noble, generous deference to each other's tastes and opinions, if the wife were seeking opportunities to express her love by actions in her courtesies to her husband, and the husband manifesting the same consideration and kindly regard for the wife, the children would partake of the same spirit. The influence would pervade the household, and what a tide of misery would be saved in families! Men would not go from home to find happiness, and women would not pine for love, and lose courage and self-respect and become lifelong invalids. Only one life lease is granted us, and with care, painstaking, and self-control, it can be made endurable, pleasant, and even happy. This Day with God, page 335. True love is not a strong, fiery, impetuous passion. On the contrary, it is calm and deep in its nature. It looks beyond mere externals and is attracted by qualities alone. It is wise and discriminating, and its devotion is real and abiding. Hearts that are filled with the love of Christ can never get very far apart. Religion is love, and a Christian home is one where love reigns and finds expression in words and acts of thoughtful kindness and gentle courtesy. Jesus wants to see happy marriages, happy firesides. Men and women can reach God's ideal for them if they will take Christ as their helper. What human wisdom cannot do, His grace will accomplish for those who give themselves to Him in loving trust. His providence can unite hearts and bonds that are of heavenly origin. Love will not be a mere exchange of soft and flattering words. The loom of heaven weaves with warp and woof, finer yet more firm than can be woven by the looms of earth. The result is not a tissue fabric, but a texture that will bear test and trial. Heart will be bound to heart in the golden bonds of a love that is enduring. The Faith I Live By, page 255. The two who unite their interest in life will have distinct characteristics and individual responsibilities. The wife is to grace the family circle as a wife and companion to a wise husband. At every step, she should inquire, how shall I make my influence Christ-like in my home? The husband should let his wife know that he appreciates her work. The wife is to respect her husband. The husband is to love and cherish his wife. And as their marriage vow unites them as one, 
so their belief in Christ should make them one in Him. What can be more pleasing to God than to see those who enter into the marriage relation seek together to learn of Jesus and to become more and more imbued with His Spirit? The Adventist Home, page 114. For further reading, In Heavenly Places, Would You Be Ready? page 356, and Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, Is It Lawful for a Man to Put Away His Wife? pages 63 to 65.